story of the Poles during the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars is one of tragedy. What happens when a nation and people that were once great power in Europe no longer exists? With its people now divided among three nations, all of whom do not want to see a Polish state rise again. The story of the Poles during this time is of a people who want their nation back and who are willing to fight for it again and again. In 1795, after the Third Partition, the state of Poland finally disappeared from the map, divided among Russia, Prussia, and Austria. Though the state was now gone, its people had not yet given up hope on regaining their own nation. It was this sentiment that led Poles to join the French in the revolution against their common enemies. In 1797, the first Polish legion was formed for the fight against Austria in Italy during the War of the First Coalition. Starting with slightly over a thousand men, numbers would quickly swell to over 5,000 Polish deserters from Austria, and new recruits were added to the ranks. During the War of the First Coalition, the legion would primarily fight in Italy, seeing success on the battlefield, and after the war would aid in occupying parts of the Italian peninsula. The short time of peace between the First and Second Coalition was not viewed as a lasting peace by many, and the ranks would continue to expand until there were roughly 10,000 men in the now multiple Polish legions before the War of the Second Coalition began. With so many French troops away in Egypt, the Polish legions and other units suffered a large number of casualties during the War of the Second Coalition in fighting against both Russia and Austria. After Napoleon was made first consul, the legions were reformed into the Italian legion, numbering only around 5,000 men. Another new legion would also be raised, numbering some 6,000 men, called the Danube Legion. It would primarily fight in Bavaria against the Austrians. The Poles would be disappointed, however, when peace came in 1801 and the Polish position was unchanged by the Treaty of Louville. As a result of nothing apparently being gained by fighting with the French, the Polish morale dropped and the strength of the legions decreased steadily. The nail in the coffin for the First Legions would be when over 5,000 Polish troops were sent to Haiti to suppress the revolution there. Most would die in the fighting and to disease. Those that survived and returned to Europe would be disheartened. Though hopes to swiftly resurrect a Polish state laid dormant after the War of the Second Coalition, Many Poles still served throughout the French army, and what was left of the Polish legion still served in the Kingdom of Naples army. It would be in the War of the Fourth Coalition that the Polish would finally get their chance to regain their nation. Napoleon did not want to commit fully to the Polish cause, but was fully willing to make use of Polish animosity against Prussia to cause problems for his enemies. In late 1806, Napoleon sent General Dabrowski and several other Polish officers who were in French service into the Polish lands occupied by Prussia to raise an army in the Prussian rear to cause chaos. Napoleon is quoted as saying, I will see whether the Poles are worthy of being a nation. Dabrowski's efforts proved extremely successful as a force of over 20,000 Polish rose up against Prussia at the same time that Napoleon was crushing Prussian forces further to the west. By the time the French forces enter Polish lands, large parts had already been liberated and fallen under the control of Polish forces. Efforts would also increase to recruit more Polish forces from the Prussian prisoners and defectors into the French army, helping to create a new Polish legion in service to France. Polish success meant that the Treaty of Tilst would establish the Duchy of Warsaw, a new Polish state mostly from lands previously held by Prussia and retaken by Dabowski's uprising. The new state, however, once more found itself surrounded by nations who at best were concerned by its existence, and at worst one, it wiped off the map once more. Politically, it was heavily influenced by France, and whether Polish politicians and nobles liked it or not, it would be French influence that would shape the new state in very important ways. The few that chafed at French control were stuck with Napoleon and the French, whether they liked it or not. The Polish state now existed due to Napoleon's success and would only remain free as long as the French Empire held control over Europe. When the new duchy's army was formed, it numbered around 30,000 men under the leadership of Joseph Poniatowski, with many being firm supporters of the French and Napoleon. A large number of the officers and soldiers were veterans from serving under France in the legions or elsewhere. Not all Poles, however, left French service, with the Vistula Legion remaining under French command and being sent to Spain where it fought bravely during the Peninsular War. 
Other Poles would also continue to serve in French units, though in much fewer numbers as many had joined the Duchy's army. Polish elements could even be found in Napoleon's Imperial Guard, namely in the 1st Light Cavalry Lancers Regiment. The War of the Fifth Coalition would see the Duchy of Warsaw fighting Austria without any direct support from France, as French troops previously stationed in the Duchy had been withdrawn. Under Poniatowski, the army engaged the Austrians in the Battle of Ryzen. Outnumbered almost two to one, they held them at bay, and the battle would end indecisively for both sides. After the battle, however, Poniatowski made the decision to abandon the capital and retreat to the right bank of the Vistula River. All efforts to cross onto the right bank by the Austrians would prove fruitless, and Polish forces would hold on to the right bank for the duration of the war. While Austrian troops were tied up occupying Warsaw and attempting to cross the Vistula, Poniatowski made his own moves, bypassing the Austrians and striking into the province of Galicia to liberate more Polish lands. Poniatowski's success in liberating large parts of Galicia forced the Austrians to abandon their occupation of Warsaw and to try and retake Galicia. The Austrians would retake some parts of Galicia, and Russia would also send forces into the province, technically on the side of the Polish, but in reality to try and deny the Polish land after the war. By the time the war came to a close, however, with the French victory against the main Austrian forces, Poniatowski's troops still controlled large parts of Galicia, and its success could not be ignored. The duchy would reclaim much of the land taken by Austria during the partitions, massively expanding the duchy's size. Polish victory would also encourage Poles to cross over from the surrounding states, and many would end up joining the army. After the war, with an influx of new recruits, the Polish army would end up doubling in size to over 60,000 men, making it a significant force in Europe. Victory by the Poles would see the return of much of the territory previously taken by Prussia and Austria during the partitions. Polish spirits were understandably high. However, the fate of Poland would come to a head eventually as one nation still held a significant amount of Polish lands, and was slowly chafing under the restrictions placed upon it by the French. Russia would have a reckoning with the Polish for one reason or another. The Russian Empire watched as the Polish state re-emerged upon the map and was seriously concerned as it grew in strength rapidly. Its very old rival appearing to have a resurgence is one of the reasons that Russia's relationship with France steadily deteriorated until the point that both sides were willing to go to war. For Russia, the French invasion of 1812 would be a fight for survival. For the French, the final act to cement domination over mainland Europe. For the Polish, however, it was an opportunity to reclaim the land taken from them by Russia. A war of liberation. It was an opportunity that the Poles went all in on, committing over 100,000 men to the invasion, showing just how large the fighting force of Poland had become since the days of the small legions in Italy. Napoleon, in an effort to encourage the Polish to commit fully to the invasion, called it the Second Polish War. The encouragement was hardly needed as the Poles had held on to their grudges from the partitions and were willing to commit as many men as possible. Polish forces would be the second largest in the invasion force, with only the French committing more men into the invasion. Polish troops, however, were spread out throughout the invading army, with only around a third of the force, numbering about 35,000 men, remaining directly under Potowski's command. Had the invasion succeeded, the Polish state would have undoubtedly expanded once more, and to that end, it is not hard to find stories of Polish bravery during the invasion. From the beginning to the end, it was the Polish who had the most to win during the invasion, and a lot to lose. The outcome in the invasion is well known, and its failure a disaster for not only Napoleon, but for the Polish as well. Over 70,000 Polish troops would be lost during the invasion, reducing the Polish force to a shadow of its former self. It is telling, however, of Polish bravery, of their resolve, and of their determination that even after the disaster, the Polish would not give up easily. After the disastrous invasion of Russia was over, the Polish state now found itself on the front line of a war, with little it could do to stop Russia on its own. With no other options, Poniatowski gathered what troops he could and left Poland with only around 12,000 men. 
What remained of the Polish forces would continue to fight with the French up to the climatic Battle of Leipzig. During the battle, Polish troops would once more fight fiercely, and Poniatowski would be made a Marshal of France by Napoleon. As it became clear that the French could not win, many of France's allies, such as the Saxons, would defect, but not the Polish. As the retreat grew more and more chaotic, it was the Polish who helped hold the rear guard, fighting street by street throughout the city of Leipzig. Poniatowski would suffer a number of wounds during the rearguard action and his attempt to cross the river, separating much of Napoleon's force from the line of retreat. Finally succumbing to his wounds, Poniatowski would drown in the river. Over 60% of the Polish force that participated in the battle would end up as casualties, with only a few thousand remaining in service to French afterwards. Still they fought on until the final force of substantial size surrendered at the fortress of Sassons in France. The Vistula regiment garrisoning the fortress nearly mutinied at the news of the surrender, and the fighting against the coalition nearly broke out once more before the men were finally calmed down by their officers. Only a few final Polish units of lancers would remain in service in Napoleon, some joining Napoleon in Elba during his exile, and others rejoining the fighting with him on the Hundred Days campaign. Throughout the Napoleonic Wars, the Poles fought fiercely, both for their own cause of having a nation of their own, and for Napoleon, the only one who could guarantee the lasting existence of a Polish state. Their ferocity, loyalty, and skill in battle deserve to be remembered, along with the tough position they found themselves in, with no choice but to back Napoleon and fight on whatever the cost may be to try and achieve their dreams.